Welcome. Tonight we will be reading Chapter 7 of Metro 2034 titled The Voyage. Let's begin. Chapter 7 The Voyage As the trolley passed through the long section of tunnel marked with bright yellow paint on the floor and walls, the helmsman couldn't pretend any longer not to hear the radiation dosimeter clicking faster and faster. He took hold of the brake and muttered apologetically, Comrade Colonel, we can't go any further without permission. Let's go just another hundred meters, Dennis suggested gently. Turning to face him, I'll release you from watch duty for a week afterwards as a hazard bonus. But this is the extreme limit, Comrade Colonel, the helmsman whined, still not daring to reduce speed. Stop. Hunter ordered. We'll walk on from here. He's quite right, the radiation level is really getting too high. The brake block squealed, the lantern hanging from the frame swayed, and the trolley came to a halt. The brigadier and the old man, who were sitting with their legs dangling over the edge, climbed down onto the tracks. The heavy protective suits, made of lead impregnated fabric, looked like deep sea diver outfits. They were incredibly expensive and rare, probably less than two dozen of them could be found in the entire metro. The two at Sebastopol had almost never been used, they'd just been waiting for their time to come. These suits of armor could absorb the fiercest radiation, but they turned even simple walking into a difficult task, at least they did for Homer. Dennis left the trolley and walked on with them for a few minutes, swapping phrases with Hunter, snatches of speeches that were deliberately clipped and crumpled so that Homer couldn't unfold and interpret them. Where will you get them? He asked the brigadier gruffly. They'll give me them. They won't have any choice, Hunter boomed, looking straight ahead. Everyone stopped expecting you back ages ago. For them, you're dead. Dead, you understand? Hunter stopped for a moment and spoke in a low voice as if he were talking to himself, not the perimeter commander. If only it was all that simple. And desertion from the order, that means a fate worse than death. Without answering, the brigadier swung his hand up, simultaneously saluting the colonel and lopping off an invisible anchor cable. Dennis took the hint and stayed behind on the dockside, while the brigadier and the old man moved slowly away from the shore as if they were fighting a reverse current, and set off on their great voyage across the seas of darkness. The colonel lowered his hand from his temple and signaled to the helmsman to start the engine. He felt desolate, left with no one to issue ultimatums to, and no one to wage battle against. As the military commander of an island lost in one of those dark seas, all he could do was, for hope for now, was that the little expedition wouldn't get lost out there and would return home someday. From the other side, proving in its own small way that the world really was round, the final guard post located in the stretch of tunnel immediately after Kakovska had been almost deserted. For as long as the old man could remember, no one had ever attacked Sebastopol from the east. Now the patch of yellow seemed less like a marker, dividing the endless concrete intestine into arbitrary sections than a cosmic lift connecting two planets that were hundreds of light years apart. Beyond it, the inhabitable space of Earth was imperceptibly replaced by a dead lunar landscape, and the apparent resemblance between them was a deception. As he focused on setting one foot in front of the other in his incredibly heavy boots and listened to his own strenuous breathing penned into a complex system of fluted tubes and filters, Homer imagined he was an astronaut who had landed on a satellite of some distant star. Indulging in this puerile fantasy made it easier for him to adjust the weight of his suit. He could explain that by the high gravity, as well as the fact that they would the only living creatures in the tunnels for kilometers ahead. All the scientists and science fiction writers never got their forecast of the future right, thought the old man. By the year 2034, the human race should have been master of half the galaxy. 
or at least the solar system, for a long time already. Homer had been promised that when he was a child, but the science fiction writers and the scientists had both started from their promise that humanity was rational and consistent. As if it didn't consist of several billions of lazy, frivolous individuals who were easily distracted, but was some kind of beehive endowed with collective reason and a unified will. As if, when it set about conquering space, it had really intended to take the task seriously and not abandon it halfway when the game got boring, turning its attention to electronics and then moving on to biotechnology, without ever achieving any really impressive results in anything, except perhaps for nuclear physics. So here he was, a wingless astronaut, a non-viable life form without his cumbersome protective suit, an alien on his own planet, exploring and conquering the tunnels from Kakova to Kashira, and he and all the other survivors could simply forget about anything more ambitious than that. It was strange, here beyond the yellow market, his body groaned under the 50% increase in the force of gravity, but his soul was soaring, weightless. The day before, when he said goodbye to Elena, before the expedition to Tula, he was still counting on coming back, but when Hunter named Homer again, choosing him as his partner for the second time in a row, the old man had realized there was no way he could weasel out of it. His insistent prayers to be tested and enlightened had finally been heard, and trying to back out now would be stupid and unmanly. He couldn't treat his life's work as a part-time job. It was pointless to play coy with destiny, promising to devote himself to his work wholeheartedly a bit later on the next time around. There might not be any next time. If he didn't set his mind to it now, what would he carry on living for afterwards? To end his days as the unknown Nikolai Ivanovich, a local crackpot, a drooling old storyteller with an erratic smile. But to make the transition from a grotesque caricature of Homer to the genuine article, from an obsessive fanatist to a marker of myths, you rise out of the ashes renewed. First, he would have to cremate his former self. He realized that if he had carried on doubting and started pandering to his yearning for a home and a woman, if he constantly looked back, he was certain to miss something very important up ahead. He had to wield the knife. It would be difficult for him to return from this new expedition unharmed or even return at all. Even though he felt terribly sorry for Elena, who couldn't believe at first that Homer had reappeared at the station alive and well after only one day away, and then cried when she failed to change his mind and saw him off again into oblivion, this time he hadn't promised her anything. As he hugged Elena tight against him, he looked over her shoulder at the clock. He had to go. Homer knew it wasn't easy to amputate more than ten years of life just like that. He was bound to suffer phantom pains after the loss. He had expected to feel the urge to look round all the time, but once he stepped beyond the thick yellow boundary marker, it was as if he had really died, and his soul had soared free, breaking out of both its ponderous, unwieldy physical shells he had escaped. Hunter didn't seem to be hampered at all by his protective suit. The loose clothing bulked out his muscular, wolfish figure, transforming it into an amorphous colossus, but without reducing its agility. He walked along side by side with the panting old man, but only because he was still keeping a close eye on him, after Nakamov Prospect, after what Homer had seen at Nagatino, Nagornaya, and Tula, agreeing to carry on roaming the tunnels with Homer. Hunter hadn't been an easy decision. But he had found a way to convince himself the long-awaited metamorphosis heralding his rebirth had begun while he was with the brigadier. It didn't matter why Hunter had dragged him along again, to set the old man on the right path or to use him for spare rations. The most important thing for Homer now was not to let this new condition slip away. To exploit it while he still could, to invent things and write them down. And another thing, when Hunter asked him to come, Homer seemed to sense the Brigadier needed him in almost exactly the same way, 
not in order to guide him through the tunnels and warn him about dangers. Perhaps in nourishing the old man's energies, the brigadier was also taking something from Homer without asking permission. But what could he possibly need? Hunter's apparent lack of emotion could no longer deceive the old man. Under the crust of that paralyzed face, magma was seething, occasionally splashing out through the craters of those smoldering eyes that didn't close. He was in turmoil. He was searching for something, too. Hunter seemed to fit the role of the future's book's epic hero. Homer had hesitated for a while and then, after the first few trials, accepted him. But there are many things about the Brigadier's character, such as his passion for killing living things, the words he left unspoken, and his miserly gestures that made the old man wary. Hunter was like those killers who taunted and provoked the police detectives, wanting to be unmasked. Homer didn't know if Hunter saw him as a confessor, or a biographer, or an org organ donor. But he sensed that this strange relationship of dependence was developing into something mutual, growing stronger than fear. And Homer was haunted by the feeling that Hunter was putting off a very important conversation. Sometimes the brigadier turned to him as if he was about to ask something and never actually spoke. But then, perhaps the old man was merely indulging in wishful thinking, and Hunter was leading him on deeper into the tunnels so that he could ring an unwanted witness's neck. More and more often, the brigadier's eyes turned to probe the old man's knapsack with the fateful diary lying in the bottom of it. He couldn't see it, but he seemed to guess that some object hidden in the knapsack attracted Homer's thoughts like a magnet, and he was tracking those thoughts, gradually closing in on the notepad. The old man tried not to think about the diary, but it was futile. There had been almost no time to pack for the journey, and Homer had only been able to hide away with the diary for a few minutes, not only long enough to moisten and unstick the pages fused together with blood, but the old man had leafed rapidly through the other pages, crisscrossed haphazardly with hasty, fragmentary entries. The timeline was disrupted, as if the writer had to struggle to catch the words that simply set them down on the paper wherever he could to render them meaningful. The old man had to arrange them in the right order. We have no lines of communication. The phone is dead. Perhaps it's sabotage. One of the exiles in revenge before we got here. The situation is hopeless. We can't expect help from anywhere. If we ask Sebastopol, we'll be condemning our own men. We have to endure it. For how long? They won't let me go. They've gone insane. If not me, then who? Make a run for it. And there was something else, too. Immediately after the final entry, calling for the idea of storming Tula to be abandoned, there was a blurred signature, sealed with a bloody fingerprint, like reddish-brown sealing wax. It was a name that Homer had heard before, one he had spoken himself. The diary belonged to the signal officer of the team sent to Tula a week ago. They passed the opening of a track leading to an empty depot, which would certainly have been plundered, if not for the intense radiation here. For some reason, the black, wilted branch line leading to it had been screened off by someone with sections of steel reinforcement bars, welded together with rather clumsily and very clearly in a hurry. A metal plate attached to the bars with wire bore, a grinning skull, and the remnants of a warning written in red paint, but it had either faded with time or had been scraped off. Homer's gaze drew him past the barred entrance deep into this dark well, and he barely managed to scramble back out. The line probably hadn't always been as empty of life as they believed at Sebastopol, he thought to himself. They passed through Warsaw Station, a terrible, eerie place, rusty and moldy, like a drowned man fished out the water. The walls, patterned in squares of tile, were oozing murky water. Through the half-open lips of the hermetic doors, a cold wind blew in from the surface, as if someone huge had set his mouth to them from the outside and was giving the station artificial respiration. Their radiation meters fluttered hysterically, telling them they had to get out of there immediately. 
Closer to Kashira, one of the instruments broke down, and the figures on the other were jamming against the very edge of the display. Homer felt a bitter taste on his tongue. Where's the epicenter? It was incredibly difficult to make out the brigadier's voice as if Homer had his head down, lowered into a bath full of water. He stopped in order to make the best of a short break and gestured to the southeast with his glove. Besides Kentamirov Station, we think the roof, the entrance, pavilion, or ventilation shaft was pierced. No one knows for certain. So, Katamirovo's deserted then, and always has been. After Kolo, Menske, the entire line's empty. But I was told, Hunter said, then broke off, gesturing to Homer to be quiet while he turned to his subtle, invisible wavelengths. Does anyone know what's happening at Kashira? He asked eventually. How could they? The old man wasn't sure he managed to give an ironic note to the anecdotal boom that emerged from his breath filters, like a trombone snorting. I'll tell you, the radiation they are so bad, we'll both be fried to a crisp before we even reach the station. Nothing will do any good. It can't go that way. We're turning back. Back to Sebastopol? Yes, I'll go up onto the surface and try to get there over land. Hunter replied thoughtfully, always figuring out his route. Are you going to go alone? Homer asked cautiously. I can't keep rescuing you all the time. I'll have enough to do saving my own skin. And the two of us wouldn't get through anyway. Even for me, there's no guarantee. You don't understand. I need to go with you. I have to. Homer cast around frantically for a reason. A toehold in logic. You have to die with meaning, the brigadier concluded for him indifferently, although Homer knew perfectly well what it was, really, the filters in the gas mask, screeching out any contaminants, letting in only tasteless, sterile air, and letting out only soulish, mechanical voices. The old man squeezed his eyes shut for a moment, trying to recall everything he knew about the contaminated lower end of the branch, about the route from Sebastopol to Serpikov, anything at all, in order to avoid turning back, to avoid returning to his meager life, to his false pregnancy with a great novel and timeless legends. Follow me, he wheezed suddenly and set off, hobbling with an agility that surprised even him, to the east, towards Kashira, into the very mouth of hell. She dreamed she was scraping a file across one loop of the steel shackles chaining her to a wall the final squealed and kept slipping off even when she already thought its blade had bitten half a millimeter into the steel the moment she stopped working a shallow almost invisible groove closed up as she watched but sasha didn't despair she took up her tool again skinning her palms as she filed away at the unyielding metal maintaining a strict regular rhythm the important thing was not to lose the rhythm, not to stop working even for an instant. In the tight grip of the fetters, her ankles had swollen up and gone numb. Sasha realized that even if she could defeat the metal, she would still wouldn't be able to run away because her legs would refuse to obey her. Sasha woke up and raised her eyelids with a struggle. The shackles had not been a mere dream. Her wrists were restrained by handcuffs. She was lying on the dirty floor of an old mining trolley that squealed with excruciating monotony as it crept slowly along. There was a dirty piece of rag stuffed in her mouth, and the side of her head was throbbing and bleeding. He didn't kill me, she thought. Why not? From where she was lying, all she could do was see a small section of the ceiling. The welded joints of the tunnel liners drifting by in an irregular patch of light. The trolley was moving along a tunnel. While she tried to get her shackled hands out from behind her back, the liners were replaced by flaking white paint. That alarmed Sasha. What station was this? It was a bad place, not just quiet, but desolate, not just deserted, but lifeless. 
and completely dark. For some reason, she had thought every station on the other side of the bridge was full of people, and the air everywhere was filled with their shouting and hubbub. So, she must have been wrong about that. The ceiling above Sasha stopped moving, grunting and swearing. Her kidnapper clambered down onto the platform and strolled about with his metal-tipped heels scraping, as if he was studying the surroundings. Then, obviously having removed his gas mask, he growled in a deep, amiable-sounding voice. So here we are then, after all these years. Releasing all the air out of his lungs in a long, lingering sigh, he hit out hard at some bulky inanimate object. No, he kicked it with his boot. It looked like a sack. But what was it stuffed with? When Sasha realized the answer, she sank her teeth into the stinging rag and started bellowing, arching up her body as if she was having a fit. She knew where the fat man and tarpaulin had brought her, and who he was ta talking to like that. It was ludicrous even to hope he could get away from Hunter. Moving like a lion, the brigadier overtook the old man in a few long bounds, grabbed hold of his shoulder, and shook him painfully. What's wrong with you? We only have to go a little bit further, Homer wheezed. I remembered. There is an access passage here, straight to the line, just before Kashira Station. We can go through it straight to the tunnel, so we won't have to go into the station. We'll bypass it and come straight out to Komalensky. It shouldn't be very far, please. Seizing his chance, he tried to break free again, but stumbled over the bell bottoms of his trousers and fell flat onto the rails with a crash. He got up again immediately and tried to jerk forward, but Hunter easily held him still on the spot, like a rat on a string, and turned the old man to face him, leaning down so that the lenses of her gas masks were on the same level. He glanced deep into Homer for a few seconds, then released his grip. All right. And now the brigadier dragged him along, not halting again for a single moment. The blood pounding in Homer's ears drowned out the frenetic chattering of the dosimeters. His legs turned stiff and numb, almost refusing to obey him. His lungs were straining so hard they smarted painfully and felt as if they were about to burst. They almost missed the black ink blot of the narrow passage squeezing into it. They ran for a few more long minutes until Hunter galloped out into a new tunnel. The brigadier was cast a hasty glance around, dived back into the passage, and shouted to the old man, where is this you brought me to? Have you ever been here? About 30 meters along, to the left of the passage, in the direction they had to follow, the tunnel was blocked from floor to ceiling by a thick curtain of something that looked like cobwebs. Reluctant to waste his breath on talking, Homer simply shook his head. It was absolutely true. He had never had any reason to come this way before, and this was hardly the moment to tell Hunter all the things he'd heard about this place. Throwing his automatic back over his shoulder, the brigadier took a long, rectangular hatchet, something like a homemade machete, out of his knapsack and slashed at the sticky white lacework. The dried-out skeletons of flying cockroaches that were stuck in the net started quivering and rustling like hoarse little bells. The edges of the ragged wound that had been inflicted immediately closed together, as if it was healing up, turning back the semi-transparent fabric of the web and sticking his flashlight inside. The brigadier lit up the passage. It would take them hours to clear it. The multi-layered webbing of sticky threads filled every part of the connecting tunnel for as far as the beam of light could reach. Hunter checked his radiation monitor, made a strange guttural sound, start furiously hacking the, away at the threads stretched between the walls of the tunnel. The cobweb yielded slowly, taking more time than they could afford now. In ten minutes, they only managed to move about thirty meters forward, and the threads were woven ever more tightly, choking the passage like a plug of cotton wool. Finally, at an overgrown ventilation shaft with an ugly two-headed skeleton lying on the sleepers below it, the brigadier flung his hatchet down on the floor. They were stuck in the web, just like the cockroaches, even if the creature that wove these nets had perished long ago, it wouldn't come for them. They would die soon anyway, from the radiation. 
In the few moments while Hunter was trying to decide what to do, the old man remembered something else he had once heard about this tunnel. Going down on one knee, he knocked a few cartridges out of his spare clip, twisted the bullets out using a penknife, and shook the powder into his palm. Hunter didn't need any explanations. A few minutes later, back at the beginning of the connecting tunnel, they tipped a heap of gray gradules into a small pad of cotton wool and held a cigarette lighter to it. The gunpowder snorted and started smoking, and suddenly, something incredible happened. The flame of the powder spread out in all directions at once, climbing right up the walls to the distant ceiling, invading all the space of the tunnel. It dashed inwards, devouring the cobweb, a roaring, blazing ring of fire, lighting up the grimy tunnel liners, and leaving behind only the occasional burnt tatters dangling from the ceiling. The hoop of flame moved inward towards Komolensky, shrinking rapidly and sucking in air like a giant piston. Then the tunnel swerved and the flames disappeared round the bend, trailing bright crimson flashes behind them. And from the far distance, breaking through the regular drone of the fire, came a call that wasn't human, something between a despairing howl and a strident hiss. Although Homer, hypnotized by the spectacle, could easily have imagined it, Hunter tossed the hatchet back into his knapsack and took out two new, unopened canisters for gas masks. I was keeping them for the way back, he said, changing his own filter and handing the second canister to the old man. After that fire, the pollution in there now is like the place had just been bombed. The old man nodded. When the flames swirled upwards, they'd stirred up radioactive particles that had been settling in the cobwebs for years, eating their way into its threads. The black vacuum of the tunnel was now filled with deadly molecules suspended in the air like millions of tiny underwater mines. They had blocked off the Voyager's navigable channel. There was no possible way to avoid them. They had to break straight through. If only your dead could see you now, the fat man scolded her derisively. Sasha was sitting directly opposite her father's overturned body, which was lying face down in the blood. Both scraps of her overalls had been tugged down off her shoulders, revealing a washed out singlet with a picture of some jolly little animal. Her kidnapper wouldn't let her see his face. He seared her eyes with a brilliant beam of light every time she tried to look up. He'd taken the rag out of her mouth, but Sasha still had no intention of asking him for anything. Not like your mother, unfortunately. I was really hoping. The elephantine legs in the blood smeared neat boots set off again around the column that Sasha was sitting against. Now his voice came from behind her back. Your know, daddy probably thought that in time everything would be forgotten, but well, some crimes don't carry the statue of limitation, slander, betrayal. His obese figure emerged from the gloom on the other side of the her. He stopped, looking down on her father's body, prodding it contemptuously with his boot. He hacked up spittle and spat out a generous goblet. It's a shame the old fellow snuffed it without my help, said the fat man, running the beam of his flashlight round the heaps of useless junk that clattered the bleak, faceless station, and halting it on the bicycle with no wheels. A cozy little place you have here. I think if it wasn't for you, your daddy would have preferred to hang himself. While the flashlight was directed away from her, Sasha tried to crawl off to the side, but a second later the beam picked her out of the darkness again. And I can understand him said her kidnapper. With a single bound, he was there beside her again. It turned out the fine little girl is just the same. You're not like your mum. I think he was probably disappointed about that too. Well, never mind. Said knocking her to the floor with the toe of his boot. At least I didn't waste my time coming all the way through the metro to get here. Sasha shuddered and shook her head. See how unpredictable everything is, Pete. He said, talking to Sasha's father again. There was a time when you used to have your rifles and love court-martialed. Thanks, by the way, for not having me executed, merely banished for life. But life is long and circumstances change, and not always to your advantage. I've come back, even if it has taken me ten years longer than I planned. It's never an accident when someone goes back somewhere, Sasha whispered, whispering her father's word. 
How oh, very true that is, the fat man jeered. And who's there? At the far end of the platform, something bulky and ponderous rustled and fell. Then, there was a kind of hissing sound and the stealthy footsteps of a large animal. When silence fell again, it was a false silence, frayed and tattered like her kidnapper. Sasha could sense something moving toward them out the tunnel. The fat man snapped the breech of his gun, went down on one knee beside the girl, pressed the butt into his shoulder, and ran a trembling spot of light over the closest columns, hearing the southern tunnels come to life after they had been empty for decades was a spine chilling as seeing the marble statues waking up in one of the central stations of the metro. A blurred shadow filtered across the beam of light just as the beam was turning away. It wasn't human though. The shape was wrong and the movements were too agile. But when the light moved back to the spot where the mysterious creature had just been, there was no trace of it. A minute later the beam fluttering wildly in panic caught it again, only ten, 20 steps away from them. A bear? The fat man whispered in disbelief, pressing the trigger. Bullets lashed into the columns and started rattling against the walls, but the beast seemed to have dis dematerialized, and not a single shot found its target. Then the fat man suddenly stopped firing senselessly, dropped his automatic, and pressed his hands to his stomach. His flashlight rolled off to one side, casting a cone of light that crept across the floor and lighting up his corpulent, hunched-over figure below. The man stepped unhurriedly out of the gloom, walking with incredibly soft, almost soundless steps in his heavy boots, in a protective suit that was too large even for a giant like him. He really could have been taken for a bear. He wasn't wearing a gas mask. His scar, furrow face, and shaven head looked like a scorched desert. Apart from the face, with hard, coarsely defined, manly features, was even rather handsome, but it looked dead somehow. Sasha couldn't repress a shudder when he, she looked at it. The other half was simply repulsive. A complicated tangle of scars transformed it into the half-mask of a folktale monster, perfect in its ugly deformity. But even so, apart from the eyes, his appearance was repellent rather than frightening. A half-crazed, prowling, probing gaze enlivened the stiffened face, enlivened it, but didn't bring it to life. The fat man tried to get to his feet, but immediately collapsed on the floor, screaming in pain, shot through both the knees. Then the gunman squatted down beside him, put the silencer on the end of his long pistol barrel against the fat man's head, and pulled the trigger. The howling broke off instantly, but for a few seconds the echo wandered under the vaults of the station like a lost spirit, bereaved of its body. The shot had thrown the fat man's chin up, and now Sasha's kidnapper lay there turned towards her. Instead of a face, he had a damp, gaping crimson crater. Sasha huddled back and started whimpering in horror. Slowly and thoughtfully, the terrible gunman turned the gun barrel on her. Then he looked round and changed his mind. The pistol disappeared into its holster, and he stepped back as if trying to disown what he had done. He opened a flat flask and took a pull from it. A new character appeared on the small stage illuminated by the dead man's fading flashlight, an old man who was breathing heavily, clutching at his ribs. He was dressed in the same kind of suit as the killer and looked absurd, absolutely absurd in it. When he caught up with his companion, the old man immediately collapsed on the floor in exhaustion, not even noticing that everything around him was awash with blood. It was only later when he came round and opened his eyes that he saw the two mutilated bodies and the mute, terrified girl hemmed in between them. Homer's heart had only just calmed down, but now it leapt again. He couldn't express it in words yet, but he had already knew for certain. He had found her. After so many nights spent in fruitless attempts to picture his future heroine, trying to imagine her lips and her wrists, her clothes and her aroma, her movements and her thoughts, he had suddenly met a real person who matched all his requirements perfectly. Of course, until now, he had imagined her quite differently. More elegant, more well-rounded, and certainly more grown up. She had turned out to be much more sinewy. She had too many sharp corners, and glancing into her eyes, instead of languorous, enveloping warmth, the old man encountered two cold splinters of ice. 
She was different, but Homer knew it was his mistake. He had failed to guess what she ought to be like. Her trapped look, her face distorted by fear, and her knackled hands intrigued the old man. He might be a master at retelling yarns, but he hadn't been granted the talent to write tragedies of the kind that this girl must have suffered. Her helplessness and hopelessness... Her miraculous rescue and the way her destiny had been woven into the story meant that he was on the right track. And though she hadn't spoken a word yet, he was ready to advance in advance to believe her. For after all, apart from everything else, this teenage girl with her white, tousled, carelessly loppled hair, pointed little ears, soot smeared cheeks, and exposed sculpted collarbones, surprisingly white and vulnerable, with her childishly plump bitten lower lip was beautiful in a very special way. The old man's curiosity was mingled with pity and a surprising tenderness. He moved closer and squatted down beside her. She huddled away and squeezed her eyes shut. A little savage, he thought. He patted her on the shoulder, not knowing what to say. Time to go, Hunter butted in. What, what about? Homer asked with a nod to, at the girl. Never mind, it's none of our business. We can't just abandon here all alone. Simpler to shoot her. The brigadier snapped. I don't want to go with you, the girl said, suddenly pulling herself together. Just take the handcuffs off. He should have the key. She pointed to the shattered, faceless mannequin. In three swift movements, Hunter frisked the body and pulled a bunch of steel keys out of an inside pocket. He tossed them to the girl and looked round at the old man. Is that all? Still trying to postpone the parting, Homer spoke to the girl. What did that subhuman brute do to you? Nothing, she said, fiddling with the lock. He didn't have time. He's not subhuman, just an ordinary human being. It's cruel, stupid, spiteful, like all of them. They're not all like that, the old man objective, but without any real conviction. All of them, the girl said obstinately, wincing as she got up on her numbed legs. It's all right. Staying human's not that easy. She certainly got over her fright very quickly. She didn't lower her eyes anymore. Now she looked at the men with a lowering, channeling gaze, challenging gaze. She walked up to one of the corpses, carefully turned its face up, arranged its arms on its chest, and kissed it on the forehead. Narrowing her eyes, she turned to Hunter, and the corner of her mouth trembled. 